Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, so we've discussed that heterotrimeric G proteins consist of these three separate uh, protein subunits. You have an alpha subunit, you have a beta subunit, and you have a gamma subunit. Now we're discussing how many different alpha subunits there are, how many different beta subunits there are, and how many different gamma subunits there are. Okay, so we're currently on the alpha subunits, and we're looking at the 16 different genes for alpha subunits. But of course, there are more than 16 different alpha subunits because of the different splice variants that come from the different genes. Okay, so there will be 21 overall different alpha subunits that are currently known. And once again, I just want to stress that every single person on this planet will have all 21 of these subunits, basically, uh, unless there's something horrendously wrong, okay? Uh, so it's not a matter of different alleles for the one gene for alpha subunits. There is not just one gene for alpha subunits. Uh, there are loads of genes. There are 16 different genes on one set of 23 chromosomes. So on your set of 46 chromosomes, you will overall have uh, 32 genes. Genes. You'll have 16 on one set and 16 on the other set. So on your maternal set, you'll have 16 genes for alpha subunits. And on the uh, paternal set, you'll also have 16 genes. Okay, and these genes are categorized into families. So you have the G-alpha-S family of G-alpha subunits, which contains two genes, the G-alpha-S gene and the G-alpha-OLF gene. Uh, then you have the G-alpha-I-0 family of G-alpha subunits, which contains three G-alpha-I uh, genes. You have G-alpha-I-1, G-alpha-I-2, G-alpha-I-3. Then it has two of these G-alpha-T uh, subunit genes, which is the G-alpha-T1 and G-alpha-T2. Then we have one G-alpha-O gene, which has two separate splice variants, the notation for which is G-alpha-O1 and G-alpha-O2. Then finally, we have G-alpha-Z and G-alpha-Gust. Okay, so overall in that family, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight members. Okay, right. Uh, so next family then. The next family is the G-alpha uh, Q slash 11 family. Okay, now this family contains four different genes, okay? So the main example, the famous example, would be G-alpha Q. Uh, then the next one is G-alpha 11, okay? But you do contain more than that. You also have G-alpha 14, and that's all very simple, but then it gets a little bit more complicated because if you read the literature on this family, you will hear people putting in two more members, G-alpha 15 and G-alpha 16. But basically, G-alpha 15 doesn't exist in the human genome. G-alpha 16 is the human equivalent of G-alpha 15. G-alpha 15 is something that you find in mice, okay? So it's a murine, which just means pertaining to mice uh, gene, okay? And it, the human equivalent is G-alpha 16. Okay, which is why sometimes you'll hear people referring to the G-alpha-16 gene collectively as G-alpha-15-16. Okay, so if you see this notation, G-alpha-15-16, that means G-alpha-16 if we're referring to humans. So in humans, you do not have G-alpha-15. You have G-alpha-16, but there is a movement to uh, recall it G-alpha-15-16 because they both do effectively the same thing. This is the one that does it in mice, and this one is in humans. Okay, so overall in this family, then, there are four genes that are found in humans. G-alpha Q, G-alpha 11, G-alpha 14, and G-alpha 16, which you might see called G-alpha 15 slash 16. But G-alpha 15, if you see that on its own, that's not found in humans. That's a mouse one. Okay, and then the final family is G-alpha 12 slash 13. Okay, and this just contains two genes, so this is again nice and simple. So we have G-alpha-12 and then G-alpha-13, which are both within this family. Okay, so basically let's count up our genes now. We've got one, two, we know we've got eight in here, that takes us up to ten. Uh, Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 
15, 16. So we ha now have the 16 separate genes that code for alpha subunits in humans. Okay, now all of, well, the reason these alpha subunits are categorized in the, into these three families are because their actual interactions are very similar. So you will often instead, well, you'll often find that people, instead of actually specifying specifically which alpha subunit they are talking about, instead they'll just tell you which of the four families it is in. So they might say, okay, we're dealing with a G alpha I naught alpha subunit here. Okay, so they'll just tell you the family it's in rather than specifying which one it's here, or which, well, exactly which one it is. Okay, so often you will see people just say, I'm dealing with an alpha subunit in the G alpha S family, the G alpha I naught family, the G alpha Q11 family, or the G alpha 12 family team family. Okay, so let's now turn our attention to the beta and the gamma subunits and then we'll go on to how you name heterotrimeric G proteins because they're named, of course, um, based on their alpha subunit traditionally. It really, what I think will uh, prevail with time is naming them uh, you know, naming them by exactly which alpha subunit they have, exactly which beta subunit they have, and exactly which gamma subunit they have, but that's not very common at the moment. Okay, but we'll look at both ways. Okay, so let's go on to the beta subunits now. So beta, you have five genes for beta subunits in the human genome, okay, and then you have overall six subunits. Okay, so again, let me stress, on a set of 23 chromosomes, so on your maternal set of chromosomes, you will have five separate genes which code for beta subunits, and because of different splice variants, you'll end up with six different proteins. Of course, on your paternal set, you'll have another five genes, so overall, you overall will have ten genes, but of course, uh, there's redundancy there. Uh, you have two genes that are doing effectively the same thing, making the same protein. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the naming system for the five beta genes, and in this case we'll actually look at the uh, different splice variants, since there's only one, uh, well there's only one gene that is, has two splice variants at least that are known at the moment. Okay, so the naming system for the five beta genes is thankfully extremely simple. Okay, so you have beta 1, beta 2, Oh, well, actually, let me do it in full. You have G beta 1, G beta 2, G beta 3, G beta 4, and I might as well finish it now, and then finally G beta 5. Okay, so these are the names for the five different genes which code for beta subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. It is the G beta 5 gene which then has two splice variants. Okay, so it then has uh, a... Uh, well, the two splice variants are then called the G beta 5, and then you put a 5 after it to stress that this is uh, one of the splice variants of the G beta 5 gene. And then uh, the other splice variant is G beta 5, and then you put an L. So these are the two splice variants. Now, for the other beta subunits, if you were naming the protein, you'd just call it the G beta 1 protein, the G beta 2 protein, the G beta 3 protein, the G beta 4 protein. But if you're naming uh, a protein that comes from the G beta 5 uh, gene, you need to specify the splice variant. So you'd say G beta 5, 5, or G beta 5, L. Okay, so those are the two different splice variants that come from the uh, G beta 5 gene. Okay, so that overall gives us six different beta subunits. Okay, and then finally, let's turn our attention to the gamma subunits. So the gamma subunits in blue then now, gamma, um, there are 12 genes for gamma subunits that are known, and there are 12 subunits, so nice and simple. Okay, at least this is what is currently understood. Right, so gamma subunits then. Again, the naming system is nice, but not perfect. If it was perfect, it would just be gamma 1 to gamma 12. There is a slight little bleep in the um, naming system for the gamma subunits. So the gamma subunits, there are 12 genes and they are called G gamma 1, G gamma 2, G gamma 3, 
g gamma 4, and you'll see why I'm going through all of this, g gamma 4, g gamma 5, and then you get this blip, okay? There is no g gamma 6 for some reason. It then goes to g gamma 7, g gamma 8, and then we continue on all the way up to g gamma 9, uh, 13, and I might as well continue this on now. It's only 5 more. g gamma 10, g gamma 11, g gamma 12, and then g gamma 13. Okay, so that overall now gives us 12 of these. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You have these 12 different genes on your maternal set of chromosomes. You have these 12 different genes on your paternal set of chromosomes. Um, and uh, they all produce just one protein. And their proteins will be called G gamma 1 protein, G gamma 2 protein, G gamma 3 protein, etc. So, that now gives us the scope of different heterotrimeric G proteins that you can make. So there are 21 different alpha subunits, there are 6 different beta subunits, and there are 12 different gamma subunits. This looks like an absolute nightmare, the number of heterotrimeric G proteins that you can make. Not all of the combinations are actually found in nature, very few of them are actually found in nature, or at least have been observed in nature so far. Um, so, what I want to now do is do some examples of naming, because basically the way that a heterotrimeric G protein is named is not the way that would be perfect for naming it, okay? So let me show you the way that you would think you would name it, and then let me show you the way that we actually do name them. Okay, so the way that I believe will take over in future years as we realise the uh, significance of the different G pro heterotrimeric G proteins uh, is as follows. Basically, you label up exactly which alpha subunit you have, you label up exactly which beta subunit you have, and you label up exactly which gamma subunit you have. So let's do an example. So we could label a heterotrimeric G protein G alpha T1, and then we could have beta 1 and gamma 1. So this would tell us that our alpha subunit was the alpha T1 subunit, so rod transducing, with the beta 1 beta subunit and the gamma 1 subunit. Now, that is how you would think it should be named, and that is how you can name it. You can name it like that, where you specify exactly which alpha subunit, exactly which beta subunit, and exactly which gamma subunit, but often people will just name it by which, um, by which alpha subunit you have, okay? And even worse, what they will sometimes do is they will, um, instead of naming which specific alpha subunit you have, they will take it back to uh, which family it's in, so they will they could end up naming this just as G I slash naught, okay? For this is a G protein where the alpha subunit is in the I slash naught family of G alpha subunits. More commonly, you won't see this called that. More commonly, you'll see it called a uh, G T. Okay, uh, because it's a transducing, and maybe they'll put GT1 to specify that it's rod transducing. So the point is that people, when they're naming heterotrimeric G proteins, do not specify which beta and gamma subunit that they have usually. They name it after which alpha subunit they have. And if they're being good, they'll tell you exactly which alpha subunit you have. If they're being bad, they'll tell you just which family of alpha subunits you're in. Okay, so let's do another example. So, another example that is actually found in nature. So, this is a heterotrimeric G protein that's found in nature. Okay, another example is G alpha I1, and then we'll have beta 1 as well, and then gamma 2. Okay, so G alpha I1, beta 1, gamma 2. Okay, so if we were being very good, what we do do is we'd use this naming, but often people will just call this a GI0 heterotrimeric G protein. So they'll just say its alpha subunit is within the alpha I0 family of alpha subunits. Uh, therefore, I will call it a G protein of the I0 type. Now, if they're being nice, they'll tell you exactly which alpha subunit it is. So they'll put GI1 maybe uh, underneath it. Okay, right. 
Uh, so there's some examples of how G proteins are named. So the important thing to understand is that usually G proteins will be named after their alpha subunits, and often they will just put which family of alpha subunits it's in, rather than uh, which specific alpha subunit it is. Okay, right. So we'll call it there for this video. In the next video, what we'll move on to is the lipid modification of the G protein subunit. So we'll look at um, myristorylation and palmitorylation of the alpha subunits because this is very, very important. It's emerging just how important this is uh, because this is what um, attaches the heterotrimet G proteins to the lipid bilayer, basically. And if they're not at the lipid bilayer, then they can't interact with uh, their G protein coupled receptors. So potentially, this is a way of, me of regulating their function, basically, by taking the uh, lipid modification groups off so that they're no longer latched there, okay? But uh, we'll look at that, and we'll also look at the prenylation of the G-gamma subunits, okay? Uh, so we'll look at lipid modification, and then we'll move on to um, a brief discussion of the G-protein cycle.